All right, all right. Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to Pest Identification and Management with Amanda of Finnegan's Farms. My name is Naja, the Education Coordinator here at Keep Growing Detroit. We have a very informative class prepared for you today. We will have opportunities for questions and answers. So if you have any, leave them in the chat and I will make sure to get them to Amanda at the right time. And as you may know, we are a free class, but if you feel so compelled, we do graciously accept donations. So if you have your phone out, go ahead and scan this code and you can see where else um, you can donate with us. You can volunteer, you can volunteer in your neighborhood. You can, you know, donate however you see fit, just pay it forward. And without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and jump into it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda. Good evening. I'm really excited to be back teaching now for the second year, this class. So tonight we're going to be focusing on, I know the class talks about pest management, but you'll get to understand a little bit of the, a little bit more of the way that I deal with um, pests and how I deal with critters out in, in the spaces that we're growing in. So really quick, a little bit about me. My name is Amanda Brazell. I am co-founder and creative director at Finnegan's Farms. We are a sustainable agricultural design firm. So we specialize in indoor and outdoor redesigns of spaces to grow food sustainably. We also have a farm where we grow cut flowers, herbs, and spices along um, using Afro, Afro <laughs> excuse me, African-American and indigenous technology. So we focus a lot on making sure that we are completely pesticide free. And um, we, we just grow using, um, basically using that technology in a way that helps us to not have to use different uh, pesticides and things like that. So I'm really excited, as I said, to be back here today talking about this for another round. So this class, if you were here last year, this one's a little bit different. Um, we kind of pared it down a little bit. So I, I do recommend having a pen and paper nearby if you have, uh, if you have one. Um, Cause I feel like this, these are things that would be good to take notes on if you can, but I believe this is being recorded. Um, yeah, it's being yeah, recorded. Yeah. Even if you just make note of like certain, you know, certain words and things like that, that you can just scroll back through to watch the video later to go back and find um, just because this, um, as Nigel said, is very, it's informative. It's pretty informative. <laughs> so let's get into it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so I know we'll be doing questions in the chat um, and um, throughout that it's kind of it's harder for me to do both so um, yeah we'll just <laughs> we'll get um, to the questions and everything but um, yeah just let me know if you have something I want to try to have this be pretty interactive. I'm also not going to read this slot word for word off the slides, um, but I will give you the general idea of what we're talking about. Okay, so. Here we go. Um, all right, so we're gonna start by talking about different kinds of insects, and then we'll talk about what some of that insect management might look like. Then we'll get into beneficial insects. Um, for me, there's really not a, um, a delineation between the two, but we'll get into that soon. Um, then we'll talk about mammals and then managing mammals, and then what sustainable management looks like, what that means, and kind of what that philosophy is behind that. Okay, so let's talk about some common insects in the garden or in on the farm. Um, you can go ahead and put this in the chat, um, but let me know how many of you guys are growing your food on a farm or growing on a, in a garden. And your garden can be your patio, it can be a, a container. Just let me know how many of you guys are out on, on big landscapes or smaller landscapes. Okay, so up first, we'll talk aphids. Um, they're really small insects. As you can see in this picture, aphids are actually the thing in the garden that make me have 
such the creepy crawly ugh, reaction. Um, when I see aphids, I I can't I can't. It's over for me. Um, I need somebody else, you know, to come and come and be out <laughs> be out there because they just you can see they're just creepy crawlies. Um, but they are a beneficial food for ladybugs and ladybugs are pollinators so even though these guys give me the itchies i it's okay they're here for a reason they're part of the, the food system so one of one of the things that i'll talk about today is it's really not it's it's gonna speed up all of your time outside this season if you are looking for a total elimination of a species the goal is really to look for a healthy maintenance and balance of species that happen to be outside because you're you're in their their territory right so what it really is is understanding how to how to balance that out so it, aphids small tiny insects they're really really little you'll typically find them on things like collard greens um leafy greens um things like that uh, can sometimes be black brown red sometimes what you'll see is you you might flip over a leaf and it's gray <laughs> on the other side. And we're like, really, it's black on the other side and it's, it's aphids. Um, and so what's really frustrating about these is that they will basically suck out of the stems on your plants like mosquitoes do us. <laughs> and that's not what you want. You don't want that to take over your plants. As I mentioned though, what you really wanna do is, you know, work on having that balance. So we'll get into that. Um, you don't want them to suck out all of that because what happens what happens to your plants is that it weakens them and then it leaves them all susceptible to disease. So that's what it, it contributes in killing the plant. It's not like it bites the plant and it dies. It it basically helps to kind of rot that plant um, overnight. If you're thinking of, uh, about like your tomatoes and things like that, sometimes they're on there as well. So here's another look at aphids. Oh, there you go. Um, that's a good look at them. Okay, so one of the things, like I mentioned, um, management, encourage beneficial insects. Um, ladybugs love aphids. So if you have things that attract ladybugs, they'll come, they'll eat those up. Um, and check on your plants. As I mentioned, you wanna flip over that leaf and see like what's under them. Sometimes your greens will look beautiful and amazing from the top and you flip them over and it's, there's aphids. Um, when you found them, when you find them, wipe them off, crush, like crush them. Um, you can also spray them with soapy water. Um, I use like Dawn dish soap. It's, it's, I found that to be a pretty gentle dish soap. You can even get the clear, free and clear version of it. Um, but that's a really gentle dish soap to use on your plants. Um, and then you're gonna take away the leaves that are really, really covered in them um, and then pull them up. Well, aphids also really like to aid in the comp composting of things. So if your plants look yellow and com like compost ready, kind of, they will, if your plants already look like they're dying, they will jump onto them. So you want to be able to um, be just checking on your plants. It's part of just being, being there. Um, we'll talk about flea beetles as well. Um, they are a type of beetle that feed on brassica families, weeds and crops. And when I say brassicas, I'm talking about like, um, you know, like your collard greens, your, uh, your broccolis, your cabbages, things like that. Um, same kind of deal. You're gonna deal with them the same as you would your aphids for the most part. You're gonna clean up a lot of the debris, clean up the stuff that they would nest in um, you don't want them to be up and in your garden space. If you've got lots of things falling over or things that are over, you're allowing to overwinter um, or go to seed, be careful with them. Um, that's a time where you can find them on your plants. Okay, same. We've got cucumber beetles as well. They feed on all members of the squash and cucumber slash melon family. And they really, they are most damaging to small animals, to small plants. So when you are in that phase of your gardening where you are um, putting in your plants, that's a time to think about them. Like, oh no, not my, you know, my little, my little babies <laughs> out there. So it's part of just making sure that you're there every day um, to check on them. Let's see. 
Who's next? Oh, there we go. And here they are. It's kind of a shame that they're pests because they're kind of cute. Okay. The tomato hornworm. Now, I'll tell you, <laughs> the tomato hornworm ate up my tomato. I had two plants. I had a few, I had a lot of tomato plants, but I had two tomato plants that just, I gave them to the hornworm. And it was because I saw the hornworm on the tomato plant stem and I pulled it off. And I don't think I moved, pulled it away far, put it up far enough away because when I came back at the end of the day, that was in the morning, all the leaves on my tomato plant had been clean, dry, like somebody had stripped some greens. And yeah, they went to town on them. So they are large green caterpillars that grow up to four inches and they have a horn-like tail on the end. Right here is a, um, the better picture of it. I can back up a little bit. Um, see, they got the cute little, the cute little horn and everything, but they love tomatoes. Um, these caterpillars eat a lot um, and cause significant damage to tomato plants. They eat the leaves, stems, and fruits of the plant, sometimes eating so much, um, let me see that, that the plants lose their leaves. And that's absolutely what happened to mine. Um, I need to go back one. So as I mentioned, you can remove them by hand. That's an option. Um, and you can use organic insecticides or sprays um, that can control them. I personally don't use any sprays. And so I don't usually promote that. <laughs> um, but in terms, you can, one thing that I did use was basil. I planted basil with a lot of my tomato plants because um, it helped to keep away aphids and hornworms. Um, so that was something that I used. I actually got a lot of my basil last year from Keep Growing Detroit through the Garden Resource Program. And all of the basil I planted, I put one next to each tomato plant that I got and um, it, it kept them away after that. So that's an option. Okay, cabbage loopers, um, pretty similar. Um, so, let's see. Um, anyway, <laughs> basically the same. Um, you're gonna going to deal with them the same way. You're just gonna pull them up when you can, and just be out there, be mindful, be in the garden. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about some of our beneficial insects. Um, so we can talk first about what are natural like enemies, um, and those are organisms that kill, decrease reproductive potential, or otherwise reduce the numbers of organisms. Um, and how do they do this? They do this through predation, parasitism, herbivory, competition, um, and it's, or just like when they essentially can like secrete substances and things like that um, to keep you away from them. So some, when we're talking about our predators, um, they attack and consume prey. They include lady beetles, lace wigs, praying mantis, um, assassin bugs, and spiders, things like that. Um, and a lot of these are going, they're really, really helpful because they come in and they are gonna eat up a lot of the other, um, they're gonna eat up the things that are eating up your plants. And that's really, really helpful. <laughs> they love that. Um, so that when you see somebody in a, you know, not all predators are bad. <laughs> um, these par uh, parasitoids, they, um, basically what happens is they, de they develop, they basically spend their entire life cycle um, inside another organism, and then they emerge as adults after they've basically like eaten the host. So that can be like a parasitic, parasitic fly or a wasp. Um, but typically they only can eat one at a time because you have one host that you take over at a time. So helpful, but slow. So let's talk about ladybugs. Um, they really like eating aphids, spider mites, um, the eggs of insects, cat, uh, caterpillars. Um, but they really, really, as I mentioned, I can't stress this enough. They really love aphids. So if you have a really big aphid problem, um, at Eastern Market, there's a guy there who sells ladybugs. You can get ladybugs there. 
um, if you need them. You can order them off Etsy, but I would recommend trying to find a local person. Or you can plant things in your garden that will attract ladybugs and they will just show up for free. Okay, um, seven spotted lady beetle. Um, these are uh, just a picture of them. So another thing to look at. No. Okay. There's some more. These are not um, your like ladybugs. <laughs> Those are different, um, but they're out there as well. And then our ground beetles, they attack aphids, slugs, snails, um, cutworms, caterpillars. Um, but they're another, they can eat multiple in a lifetime and they'll be out there as well. Again, these are, and they come out at night as well. Again, this is something that you're gonna be looking to plant things in the garden to attract them. But also, again, if you have a lot of these things like aphids and stuff, they'll show up because they're ready to eat. Um, we have assassin bugs. Um, they attack many insects, including tomato hornworms and other big car caterpillars. You can see down here in the corner, they're like literally ganging up on this one here. Um, but they will do that as well. Let's see. Here's an, another photo of one attacking another bug. Oh, let me go back. And here's another. Here. Oh. Here we have the green lace wig. You can get a picture of it in a couple of different stages. They are, they'll go ahead and eat aphids as well, mealybugs, caterpillars. So they're out here having, it's truly like a bug's life out there, guys. It's like everything's happening out there, which is the reason why it's important to understand all of this um, so that you're not, you have to understand that you're, you as um, somebody who's out there tending land, you are entering into a whole domain where there's literally a whole kingdom going on outside. Um, and so it can be really easy to think, oh, let me just come in and spray some stuff and put some stuff down. Um, but you're also destroying an ecosystem when you move in that way. So the goal is to really not focus so much on total elimination, but to maintain a balance. Because also, too, if you kill a lot of things, then there's nothing for some of these other critters to eat as well. So some others. Here's a picture of a praying mantis back here. Ooh. Ooh. over here okay um and then we've got uh the brachnoid wasp so they're really interesting because they will um they will paras they will be case basically become a parasite to a tomato hornworm or to these cabbage worms that's what you see these little white things are on um its back here's another picture of them but they will just lay their eggs here and um, that's how they that's how they move. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about common mammals in the garden. Um, Man, this, oh yeah, we jump into that. Let's pause for a second and get some of the questions. We have a few questions about the uh, insects you mentioned. Oh yeah, let's I mean, um, go. Okay, so the first Question is from Alexander Alexandra von Osdahl. He's asking about uh, soapy water. Does that work on getting rid of some of the bugs? Is that something you're gonna cover mm -hmm. later on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can use the soapy water. I truly, I would get like a, um, I don't have one close to me, but you know, like a, a, a decent sized spray bottle. You can get them at the dollar store, the bigger one. <laughs> um, and I would do some soapy water, like you're gonna make bubbles, you know, like if you were gonna make up some bubbles for some kids to play with, add in some, you know, fill it up with water, a couple of drops of soap, um, and you can spray that as a spray. You can also take uh, the hose, if you have a hose, and put it on a high setting, a high enough setting that it's not gonna hurt your plant, but you can spray them off using that. The soapy water kind of acts to deter them. If you can't find the clear Dawn, then the blue one works really well because they don't like the smell of it. I don't know what they put in the blue one, but they don't like the smell. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. 
And we have a question about the white moths that lay eggs on leafy veggies. Now, the white moths, are those the um, adult like the cabbage, the cabbage uh, beetles or something once they, it's, it's uh, oh, it? the, oh, like the little cabbage. Yeah, the cabbage uh, looper. Uh, Honestly, that I don't know, but I can check. Um, but in terms of the moths themselves, um, so one thing that I actually do is I lay trap crops where I have certain crops like kind of away from like let's say I'm growing cabbage in one area I would also grow maybe one or two cabbages in another area um, and kind of work to use those crops as like a trap for all of that like I basically there's things that I grow in my garden that I know are going to be eaten by the white moths and so I just grow a, like an extra plant or two for them. <laughs> That's the best way that I have managed them. Um, but yeah, it's really hard to get rid of them because it's, you know, it's like a, trying to get rid of an airborne thing, you know? And so, you know, it's like tr trying to get rid of butterflies and those are the things that you want inside to be beneficial. So the things that you would use to really get rid of moths, you would also get rid of your some of your butterflies as well. Um, what you can do though, is when you see those eggs, you can crush them um, and pull them off. Okay. All right. So we do have a few other questions about getting rid of the um, insects. Amanda is gonna go through that later on in the series. So we can hold off on those questions about the management of it. Cause we are gonna go over that as well. So, let me see, anything related to the actual bugs you are seeing? Are there certain bugs you need help identifying in your garden? Certain bugs doing things that you've never seen before? I know awesome. I saw the other day, it was like uh, these little uh, balls. They look like soap balls that grew on top of somebody's soil and they were like living organisms. So <laughs> I don't know if anyone on this call has had that, has had that problem, but. I see uh, one question about flea beetles uh, from Betty. Mm -hmm. um, you can try marigolds. Mm -hmm. um, I found that that can help. Also, one thing that I would look into is because not every not everyone's going to want the same things growing in their garden. So mm -hmm. one thing that you can do is look up like herbs that that deter flea beetles or herbs that deter deter cabbage moth things like that. Mm -hmm. um, or there's another question down here that was, um, what plants can you use to encourage ladybugs to come to your garden? I always suggest a really nice, something that flowers, something that's bright that will bring them in. Um, but again, that's one where I would go, you know, what are, you know, Michigan plants that attract ladybugs, something like that. And then check out your local nurseries. Um, and I can put some of those resources in the chat as well about where you can go and get like those Michigan, like indigenous plants. Those plants serve to attract the things that you want and get rid of the things that you don't. Want. So I can put that information in there. But yeah, there's so many different things that you could use that I would encourage you to check and see like what are some things that I could use to deter this thing because like for me I'll grow all the herbs all the flowers all the things because we use that we use them all for different things but some people are like I hate mint I would never plant mint you know so um and then this last one was um how I have a lot of spiders how can I deter this you can sometimes a lot of spiders are attracted to um decay and water so if you, sometimes you'll get a lot of spiders because they are, the, the, your garden is wet or because there are brush piles and things like that. Um, depending on how the spider, what kind of spiders you're attracting, um, you might just wanna leave them around because they will catch all of those little buggies that fly around in the air that you don't want. Um, so they're kind of like the air filters, so. Um, that I would encourage them to stay if you can. But if you're a, a non-spider person, like I kind of am, <laughs> um, I totally get wanting them to like be in other places. Mm. Okay, cool. Do you want to go ahead and just answer these uh, last two about uh, some preventive questions? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We I have just... um, Juanita. She was asking about the soapy water. Is it okay to apply it in the sun? She knows that neem burns apply them yeah because you're essentially you're going to be spraying them with soapy water and i should add that you'll spray them back down with like fresh water after that um i wouldn't leave oh. leave it on the plants um okay. and if you're having issue with neem i wouldn't apply i don't apply neem directly to my plants i actually apply neem kind of around the base of the plant a little bit um very diluted so that the scent is up and around the plant um, but not necessarily on it. All righty. And you have one more question. Where did it go? Oh, can you use comfrey for your fertilizer? Um, yeah, you can use comfrey. Comfrey. Um, I'm not sure what it does in terms of combating, com combating anything, but you can definitely use it as fertilizer. All right. Let's see, are we ready to move on to mammals? We can move on to mammals, yes. All right, let's see. All right, here's some fun pictures. Okay, so let's talk birds. Um, so birds, that's, so, oh, so a lot of the mammals that we're gonna talk about are kind of like, a, we can see the benefit and we can also see what, they, what they're doing and then at the end, we'll talk about what you can do to collectively maintain that balance um, at, at the end. So birds are, you know, that's give or take. On one hand, right, um, they eat your sunflower seeds before you can get to them. Um, but they also help to bring that balance to the ecosystem and the fact that, you know, sometimes birds spread seeds. Birds also are around to eat as food for other um, other creatures. So you want them around. Um, and they also, birds that peck into the ground um, to get worms and things like that, um, they not only help to control the insects around, uh, uh, and those bug populations, but they help to aerate the soil in your garden at the same time. So um, back when I'm backing up a little bit into insect, uh, them controlling bug populations, we have some birdhouses that we use in different, um, like on our homestead, we have some birdhouses that we use because they eat the different bugs and things like that that fly around. Um, we're also in the process now of growing birdhouse gourds to hollow out to add more birdhouses around um, the farm area where we have because we found that they really help to keep control that bug population. They also really help to control the mosquito population. So. Birds are really helpful to have around. Like adding a bird feeder to your garden can do a whole lot. Um, squirrels, they they are often the main mammal in the garden, watching your plants as much as you are. That's one thing I noticed about them. Those squirrels know when your food is ripe. <laughs> you might not have a mo you might not know or 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 think that they're ready to go, but that squirrel, they're watching and they're they're gonna come and eat um, when they're ready. Um, and so they are an integral part of our food system, though, especially where there are trees. Um, and they also act as natural pollinators and little farmers themselves because they plant seeds as part of their natural rhythm. So, again, we need our squirrels. Um, they're out there as like little mini arborists. <laughs> um, but we do also know that, you know, I have squirrels. My, my sister can't grow sunflowers because the squirrels swing on them every year um, and then come and eat them. So, you know, it's. You have to say, okay, <laughs> got some bunny, some rabbits. We got a cat here. So you might not want rabbits eating everything in your garden. I totally understand that as well. Um, they are beneficial, surprisingly, to the ecosystem. They are masters at composting. Um, they, pr they produce excellent manure for your garden as well, just like chickens. Um, and so to keep a good balance, try growing crops specifically for the rabbits in the yard to keep them away from the other plants. Um, that's what I do. I plant you know, little things that like, I, I'm not very good at growing carrots. They don't get to be very big, but the rabbits like the little carrot tops. <laughs> so they eat that and they don't, they don't come in the garden space. Um, cats, they help control the rodent and bird populations in the garden space as well. Um, and sometimes their urine can deter other critters. Um, if you have a frequent cat in your garden or farm, try contacting the Humane Society for spay and neuter services 
and then letting them roam the yard to catch mice and other rodents. And a lot of the time, um, especially here in the city, they'll come and do that for free. They'll come and like, will spay or neuter your um, farm or garden cats um, to help with the population control. But we keep cats on the farm specifically because they eat the mice and uh, and other things on the on the farm as well. So they're really, really helpful. And they're like cute. <laughs> okay, mice, voles, and rats. Honestly, these are not all the same, but I'm lumping them together for the same reasons. Um, these critters, for the most part, act as scavengers. Um, and it's important to note when you have rats more specifically, because it could mean that there's trash or rotting food in your garden that you're not aware of. Um, it's also important to control these populations um, because they, they love to eat freshly planted seeds and seedlings, especially mice and voles. They, will, they love to go dig up, you know, a corn shoot and eat that up. Um, they love that. Um, so, and their excrement um, themselves itself can carry diseases. Um, and they're super, super good at burrowing in places that you don't want them. Like they can sometimes take up residence in the bottom of garden beds, um, in in grow bags. It, it can be a it can be a lot. And if you're somebody who is not a fan of little rodents, um, it can be kind of an agonizing process to try to control that population after they've already got in there. So we will absolutely in just a second be talking about how to control that and how to not have them in there. And then groundhogs, um, they're also known as woodchucks. They're medium-sized rodents. Um, they, have a, they have stout bodies, short legs, bushy tails, um, and their fur can range in color from brown to gray. Groundhogs are herbivores and primarily feed on vegetation. Um, they eat a variety of plants, including grasses, clover, dandelions, and agricultural crops like vegetables and fruits. And groundhogs can be considered pests when they feed on garden plants, including vegetables and ornamental plants. Their burrowing activities can also damage lawns, fields, and structures. And if you have ever twisted your ankle in on a field because there was, you know, groundhog rows, then I'm sure you understand um, that. I did see um, some uh, questions about, um, what a chipmunk in here would we categorize chipmunks and rat with rats and mice i don't know um oh i will put them with squirrels but um let's get to con the controlling so let's talk about managing them again it is difficult to eliminate small animals from the garden um, we can understand that we get a lot of benefits from having mammals in the garden, so it's best to work toward maintaining a balance, again, versus a total elimination. Um, the ideas listed below work well in certain circumstances and even better in combination with others. So what my advice is, is to try a combination of these to see what works for you to minimize the damage. So you can start by doing fences. Um, you can start by doing traps. What I found that um, if you do trapping for things like groundhogs um, and you, you do have to take them very far away from your property in order for them to not come back. Um, and truthfully, if your garden is just that delicious, somebody will be back. Um, so trapping can sometimes be a, a time consuming process. Um, and I, I wouldn't recommend doing it unless you really want to work with an animal trap. <laughs> um, but fences are a really good way to start. You can start with some fences um, in places where they can't necessarily crawl under. Um, border plantings like onions, marigolds, garlic, chives, mint, comfrey. Um, those are things that you can use to deter all of the things that I just talked about, um, with the exception of birds. Um, but yes, your marigolds, rabbits will, the rabbits don't really like it. One thing that you can do, like, let's say that you own, you planted some marigolds in one space. You can also go and get a whole, you can go get a flat of marigolds as well and take their heads and crush them up and sprinkle them around some of your other plants. Cause it's that smell that all of these little critters don't like. These, everything I listed here also helps to deter all of the insects that I mentioned before that are prey. Um, so planting things like that garlic, those onions, basil, um, those really, really 
um, those herbs that you can really, really smell, those things will get rid of both those um, smaller mammals and the, um, the insects as well. Um, let's see. So uh, um, the note here is be careful with mint and comfrey. They can spread. Um, and what I like to say with that is, you know, you can use them to make tea and fertilizer. So if it's working for you, um, find a way to work that into the things that you have going on in the kitchen and things like that, too. So you're not, you know, you're not growing it for, for nothing. Um, alternate food source outside the garden. Um, this may be risky um, if it attracts more pests. This is what I mentioned in terms of trap crops. So I have collard greens that I grow outside of the perimeter of my garden because for some reason, those are the ones that get, those are the ones that will attract those aphids and the ones on the inside don't, don't do that. And the way that I end up determining that is, you know, I put all of my collards kind of in the same place because I usually use, I usually grow them in growing bags or in like um, containers. And then whichever ones get aphids on them, I just move them to the outside of my garden and I just let them have that. <laughs> and then everybody else, I just leave inside. That doesn't work for everyone, um, especially if you have a, a really deep investment in every single one of your plants um, or don't have the means to just buy extra plants to let them uh, get eaten up. I totally get that. Um, what I would do is then plant things like, you know, those, those marigolds, garlic. These other things too, you can take these marigolds, garlic, onions, you can cut these things up and soak them in water overnight, like hot, like just pour hot water over them overnight. Um, and then take that and dilute it a lot <laughs> with some water and start spraying them kind of on the ground around your plants. So it's really the scent that you, that they don't like. Um, let me go back one. Um, human hair, you can use that. Um, some things will use human hair to create nests. So that's give and take. Um, soap bars, people use Irish spring. They'll just um, shred it up around the garden. It keeps out things um, as, you know, the mammals I'm talking about. And then repel repellent sprays, as I mentioned, often made of blood meal, urine, citrus, juice, lemongrass, um, garlic. You can make at home or buy them commercially. And then again, outdoor cats or dogs, if you can keep them out of the garden, um, are good to have out, sit, out there. All right, awesome. Well, we do have a few questions about the mammals. I'm gonna go ahead and answer these. Let's see, the first question, oh, you, you did discuss uh, woodchucks. Juanita, did she answer your question about how to control woodchucks? All right, we'll go to the next one. If you need more um, answers, just um, put put it back into the chat, Juanita. Oh, she said yeah. Oh, okay. Would you categorize chipmunks with rats and mice? Um, no, I would probably lump them in with squirrels in that they do the, a really similar job to squirrels. Um, your chipmunk population isn't going to get out of control unless you really have something that they love. Chipmunks are really going to be in there. The most you might have an issue with the chipmunks is that they dig up stuff to bury things. <laughs> so for them, you would be just trying to keep, you know, they, they're not going to really travel in pack. Whereas usually if you see one or two mice or one or two rats, there's a family somewhere. Mm -hmm. So they're a little bit more, um, that's, they're a little bit more like you really have to be on that population control. Okay. Okay, and how does one eliminate the smell? You know anything about smells of rodents in a garage? Um, no, I'm trying to think of something that would mask a smell perhaps or deodorize, but I'm well, not so, sure. So my question is, um, I think animals leave scents, right? And so if you have a groundhog, um, they'll leave, or possum, they'll leave a scent. So if you get rid of it, because you talked about that, <laughs> the scent might attract oh. other ones. And so just sending um, a groundhog away 10 miles doesn't mean that other groundhogs won't come back because they've left a scent. You know, they've marked their spots. 
And so is there any way that uh, yeah, you could use like um uh Frank W mentioned down here, um coyote urine. Um that's something that works with um to address the raccoon question in here as well. Um you could basically you would have to just get the urine of something that is a natural predator to the things that you're trying to get rid of. Um, because then it's like, oh, you know, the groundhogs aren't going to come back or like the raccoons aren't going to come back because they don't want to get eaten. <laughs> so, you know, that that's something that you could use to like maybe add that to kind of mask the smell um, using basically a predator's urine in that area. Okay, thank you. That's, that's you. <laughs> Um, you mentioned not spraying neem oil on the vegetables. Um, I personally don't because as I, um, as someone else mentioned in the in the chat, it's um, it can burn the plant sometimes if you don't dilute it properly. So you know, so for me, sometimes I'm not I'm paying enough attention to like make sure I'm doing it 100%. So I just kind of avoid it altogether and don't put it on the, on the plants and things like that. I put it around it in the area. Um, just to make sure I don't burn anything. But that's just a personal preference. You can definitely do it. You just need to make sure you dilute it. Okay. Now is pepper a deterrent? That's a question from Sharon. Mm -hmm. It can be. And for the same reason, for the same reasons with the neem oil, you just want to be careful. Um, you don't want to burn your plants because that um, capsaicin that's in your peppers and then that pepper spray essentially is, um, that's what, that's what is what it is. Um, and you can spray that on other things. I guess it depends on what you're using it to using the spray to deter. Um, it's not really going to be the thing to deter your insects, but could be the thing to deter some bigger things um, like rabbits and stuff like that. Um, but the the spray off peppers that I think that's really just it's going to be just a personal thing and see how I would test it and see how you like using it and what it does. Right. Okay. And Sakai is asking or saying we already have problems with raccoons. Will the same repellents be effective on raccoons? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, rac raccoons are going to come in because you have something to eat. Um, things that maybe have fallen or, you know, sometimes a lot of these things are coming in the garden um, after when the food is really, really ripe or when it is when it has fallen off the vine. And so it's part of being mindful and that, you know, you're checking on things. And if you start to notice like squirrels and birds and things like that, eating the stuff in your garden, it's, it's just time to eat it. Typically you can keep a lot of these things away by harvesting things on time um, and making sure that your plants are not yellowed and yellow and discolored. Which leads into this question here by Joanne saying, is there a particular time um, in plants life cycle when insects are most likely to attack. It depends on which kind of, in, which insect it is. Some, some, some of them like the seedlings, some of them like decaying plants, but ultimately what you're going to want is to make sure that your plants look healthy. Um, when you, the healthier your plants look, the least, look, the less likely you are to have different kinds of things feeding on them because they're not looking to it to, for, as food. Um, but yeah, typically it's mostly just making sure that your plants look healthy. And then knowing that they're, you know, when things are seedlings, when they're babies, you still have to look after them, still have to take care of them, pay attention to them because there are things that will like, that do like that fresh little baby crop. Um, and then there's other things that, you know, they, they're, they host in plants that are dying and decaying. Um, what will I need to plant to keep my ladybugs contained in my area um, as opposed to flying into another area? Um, hmm. That, I guess, again, that's more of like a, um, more of a personal one of just kind of looking and seeing like Michigan plants, Michigan indigenous plants that attract ladybugs because there's a wide variety of them that will come in and do everything you need them to do simply because you have bright blooms. Typically anything though that's, that's gonna have a bright bloom, I would just pick your favorite color bright 
bright flower of something. Um, and it's even better when whatever it is that flowers is something you can eat too. All righty, were there any more questions? Thank you. Jump into the next segment. You have one more. When you have a dog, what vegetable plants or chemicals are dangerous? Well, I know that like garlic and onions can be dangerous. Um, I'm trying to think. Who else? There's a lot. Of, there's a couple of different things that can be pretty dangerous, but I know for sure garlic and onion can be. Um, chemicals, for the most part, anything that you're spraying out there is not going to be super, is not going to be good for your, um, your, your dogs or your cats, simply because it's just, um, a, uh, chemicals. Oh, thank you. Um, Alexis said, uh, rhubarb. That's one. Um, but my dogs spend time in the garden and they, I have a problem more so with my, my dogs eating my sunflowers and sun jokes, they'll just like bite the heads off of them because they, they like them. But honestly, if you've had like sunflower microgreens, I, I totally get it. They're tasty. But I actually, my dogs really like sunflowers, so they'll eat them, the heads, um, like the little shoots. But um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Well, I guess we can go ahead and jump into the next segment sustainable management. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about this approach. Um, pests are indicators of how far a production system has strayed from the natural eco ecosystems it should in, uh, imitate. Um, insect pests are attracted to plant a plant that is weak um, or you know looks like it's not healthy. In a well-balanced system, massive pest outbreaks are rare due to the presence of natural predators, parasites, and disease agents. So that's why we talk about maintaining a balance versus that just get rid of it all. I'm, I'm getting rid of it because you need all of these things. You need the cats, you need the, the birds, you need the uh, parasitic wasp. You need each and every one of these to keep everything working um, together. And also one thing to keep in mind, I feel like gardening and taking care of the earth is something that has been a humbling experience for me because I have to remember that like again I'm in someone else's space I'm in someone else's kingdom I'm not you know I'm not in my house like I'm in somebody else's house and they're all we're doing something and taking care of themselves and, and doing a whole ecosystem before I ever decided to put my my farm here so that's something to keep in mind um so we can talk about organic pest uh management so more of a prophylactic holistic approach versus a remedial approach. It's not about um, treating the symptoms. The pest problem usually indicates a um, suboptimal growing conditions and it, some sort of imbalance. So the emphasis is really on biodiversity and optimal um, cultural practices. Um, so here's an example, um, a conventional approach will be to spray insecticide to control caterpillars, which often results in a secondary outbreak of aphids or spider mites because the beneficial insects such as the lady beetles and other predators are also killed. Um, when we're looking more at an organic approach, the, your, the goal is to enhance the habitat for beneficial insects to increase the population, reduce stress on uh, crop plants, use adaptive varieties, and use non-chemical methods to control pets, like um, picking things by hand, row covers, alternating plant uh, dates, and traps. So let's talk about some of these traditional controls. Um, I will list them out, and then we'll get we'll talk a little bit more about them in detail. So, uh, resistant cultivars, crop rotation, companion planting, the timing of your planting uh, matters sanitation, soil management, mulches, composting, tillage, uh, flaming, and trap crops. So resistant cultivars. Some varieties may be less attractive to pest species or others to or other um, tolerate more damage than others. Plant th this is due to the size, shape, the color, the, the leaf hair, the cuticle thickens, and the natural chemicals um, that can affect 
uh, pest susceptibility. So those are things, um, herbs can fall into this category a lot of time. Very fragrant herbs can fall into this category. Lemongrass, that's something you can use to um, deter mosquitoes around the garden. And if you're making like sprays and things like that from soaking that lemongrass, you can put that as a natural thing around your garden, on your body, things like that. Um, because they're the smells that they create um, resist that. Um, it's also important to note here that plants really don't like to be eaten. We, we eat them and we love plants, so we forget that. But plants don't, a lot of plants don't like to be eaten. And so they put out a scent um, when, the, when they're in stress. And that's essentially what you're getting when you're crushing herbs and things like that. And so that scent can be used to deter um, things in the garden. Um, here we go. Uh, plant produced compounds that deter certain pests, um, like uh, pyreth pyrethrum is, is derived from the blooms of African chrysanthemum. Some plants have specific color related resistance. Most insects are attracted to leaves in the yellow green color range. Healthy dark green leaves are less attractive than yellowing plants under stress. Um, and that's mostly just like, you know, the balance they can, it's just like the colors that they can see. Anyway, um, crop rotation. So insects overwinter in soil and debris and reinfest re new, crop, new crops of susceptible and buried up populations. Three questions to consider when deciding whether crop rotation will help manage a pest is, how long can the pest persist in the field without any host? How capable is it of invading from, um, from other areas? And how well does it survive on other hosts when the crop is not present? So that's really important to note. Like if I move this crop, um, is it actually gonna get rid of the, the pest issue in this area? Um, is it gonna come from another space? And does, if I move, out, move this, is it just gonna eat something else uh, instead? So you really want to um, pay attention to that before you decide to move things. Um, so you're going to plant non-susceptible crops so pests have no food. Um, and again, that sometimes can be things like, um, you know, if you find that there's a pest that really, really eat, loves to eat one specific thing in your garden, maybe consider not growing that. But I know that it's like you don't want to limit what you have to grow. So um, that's kind of like the last resort. Um, know your botanical families, leave as much time as possible between related crops. So if you are going to move those crops, um, pay attention to what you're putting in its place, because if you're just refilling that space with food, um, then you didn't, you, you aren't necessarily solving the problem you might have. Um, it also, this point to make though, um, that insects overwinter in soil and debris, um, that is also true for our beneficial insects as well. So if you have the space, um, I would consider moving, if you've got um, s s debris and things like that in your garden, that's why in the fall, you should pull away all of that debris and put it away before the winter comes. Um, put it in, if you have a wooded area, put it into the woods. If you have a, a, a saw or something, cut that wood up, those kinds of things so that you don't necessarily have just big piles of things in the garden area or in the farm where the crops will be growing, you wanna move all of that stuff out and put it, um, even if it's just a brush pile, things like that, because there are things that do live in those brush piles over the winter that you will need in order to pollinate your plants come spring. The good thing is that um, the bit that's what the benefit is. So I would recommend keeping that stuff, but pull it away from the garden as much as you can. Um, and the butterflies and stuff will find their way back. Okay, so here's one example of crop rotation. It's um, done through different years and you can see, you know, maybe year one, bed one, we've got our tomatoes and on down and through the beds, you've got, you know, your spinach, carrot, clovers. Um, and then next year in the bed one, I'm gonna be planting spinach. That's a whole other family. Um, then year three in that same bed, I'm planting onion and then I'll come back with clover. Each of those things add something to the soil and each of those things take something away. So you just want to be mindful of that um, as you're as you are rotating your crops. Okay, here we go. Companion planting. This is probably my favorite thing to use in the in use 
out in the garden um, because it's just the thing that works the best for me. Um, the attracting crops, small flower, um, carrot family, daisy family, mints, catnips, caraway, dill, fennel, hyssop, lemon balm, parsley, <laughs> rosemary, thyme, yarrow. Um, these kinds of things love to be planted um, with more repellent crops like basil, nasturtium, catnip, um, and those kinds of things because they will repel all of these things, all of them working together will attract all of the, the things that you need and will repel all of the things that would, will eat up your crops before you get a chance to. Um, these are all things that I grow on my farm. And so it's a little bit easier for me to have this variety of things, right? We grow herbs and spices and we do specialty herbs. And so for us to have a big row of hyssop or dill or parsley is really normal but if you're thinking about a backyard garden or a smaller space or even a container garden then you really don't have all of that space to do that i would consider planting smaller things like your lemon balm um something like a smaller thyme or a rosemary something that you can keep in a pot um even basil you can plant those in on container gardens because they'll do this they'll have the same effect and then you'll be able to use them in your kitchen as well um, and so, again, lots of uh, recommendations out there. Um, uh, this is, um, I guess, in more so the Western tradition, there needs to be more studies before um, getting deeper into it. Um, but this is something that's traditional uh, technology uh, used by Black and Indigenous people for generations. So there's lots of information on this and why it works and what works. Just find something that you really like. Um, I typically will do, if I have like a vegetable growing, I'll grow with it a flower and I'll grow with it uh, an herb um, and then let the three of them work together like that. So just pick something you like. Okay, timing of planting. That's important. Um, pretty much because you're, what, you wanna, what you don't want to do is plant something right when a bunch of certain things, well, a bunch of things are hatching. Springtime is good for hatching and it's also good for planting. So it can be a little bit difficult to not plant at the same time as other things are waking up. Um, but that can also look like planting while it's a little cooler outside. Um, before certain things wake up, um, giving your plants an opportunity to establish before some of those uh, pests do wake up. Um, and then, you know, just experiment, see which kinds of things um, you want to plant at a certain time. Sometimes you have to just be okay going with the process and knowing that, hey, I could plant this this year and it might, this might not be su super successful, but I'll find out why and I'll adjust for next year. Um, plant crops that are, um, Plant crops susceptible um, to nematodes early or late um, while soil temperatures are cooler. So it's things like that. So, you know, if you're able to plant things while things are dormant, then that's a really good, that's a better time to do it um, where things that maybe are living in the soil are not awake just yet. Um, but I don't typically focus too much on the timing of planting because for me it's very much like you know it's springtime farms open we got to get stuff in the ground so that might not always be on everybody's mind and sanitation making sure to keep up with healthy um you know you're going to select healthy plants I'm the kind of person that wants to save every single little baby plant um you know I got a tray of seedlings and there might be one little one and I'm like you're gonna make it I'm gonna have you out here you're gonna do your thing and I will say sometimes that little that little plant that could makes it. Um, and I'm usually proud of them. But other times that plant get, turns yellow and sickly and it, it's not one that ends up being completely viable, especially if you're looking for a robust crop. So you have to let them go. I add them to my compost to honor that life cycle though. Um, but you do, one really th one thing to, that you do have to do is make sure that you're selecting plants that are ready, ready to withstand a full season of growing. Um, rogue and prune them pull up you have to pull up some of them if they're not doing well again that is super hard for me um, I don't like even thinning out my seedlings because I feel like I'm just it feels like I'm on like a game show and I have to pick between my like my two favorite favorites or something like that and they're in the bottom two I, it's just really hard for me to have to pull up my plants um, but that is, it's, it's necessary in order for your plants to survive and have a healthy life cycle. So you will have to space out some of your plants. Sometimes they get bigger and they're too big to be next to each other. And what that does is it creates homes for 
um, you know, moisture and things like that to be sitting on your leaves and other plants to take up host. I mean, other um, insects to take up host in your plants. And so you do have to thin things out. Um, you might have that one tomato plant that is bigger than the rest and is doing its thing. You don't want to kill it, but it's necessary. You might have to go to that bottom third of that plant and cut off all of those leaves because they're, it's choking out um, the plants under it. So keep that, keeping that in mind. And then remove debris promptly and reduce overwintering sites uh, to reduce overwintering sites for pests. So when you get, you get down to that fall time, um, when we're talking about closing up the garden, getting ready for winter, it's really important that you move those things away. And also when you're out there pruning, I know, I know that I can go out and prune a whole field and have like little piles <laughs> of tomato leaves that I have on the ground or pepper plants or whatever, you know, but it's really important that you go and pick those things back up and clean up that workspace when you're done um, because you don't want those things just um, degrading right there. It, if you don't want to throw away those things, often like myself, I will just add those things to my compost. Um, and then eliminate alternate hosts, um, and, but be careful about timing. So again, um, you really, you, sometimes you, you are like, oh, well, let me just pull up this plant. They're eating it. It's over. Um, but be, be careful because you could pull up something and it's just eating something else. Um, your soil management, healthy soils, high in organic matter. Um, and with a biologically diverse food web, support plant health and nutrition better than soils, low in organic matter um, and species diversity. Healthy plants are generally less susceptible to pest damage. One thing that we also want to talk about when we're thinking about um, pesticides and spraying things on plants, you want to be careful about what you're putting in the soil. Soil erosion is a, one thing that really, um, soil erosion is something that's, that's incredibly important to take note of because if we don't have soil to grow anything in, we can't eat, we can't breathe, we cannot survive, and it throws off the balance of the entire ecosystem. So when you have to be careful in what you're putting, in your soil because you can alter the pH and you can um, disrupt the species that live in the soil that keep all of the, the you know, everything alive down there. Um, approximately 75% of insect pests spend part of their life cycle in soil. So healthy soils contain many natural enemies of insect pests, including predators, fungi, and other parasitic uh, nematodes. So don't kill your soil, build it up. Um, another thing to do is to keep your leaves, leave your leaves on the ground um, after the, the, when the, when the season is over. Um, not only is it a beneficial, is it a home for your beneficial insects, but it also helps to rebuild your soil after you've grown in it all year long. Um, a soil's con a physical condition, um, its level of compaction, able to hold water, drainage, all of that affects the, the health of your soil and your plant. Again, the chemical aspects of soils like your pH, salt, salt content, availability of nutrients, all of that will affect the health of your crops um, and its pest susceptibility. So we talk, this, this is an example of your food web here, right? You've got your plants up here. This is us in the sun with the garden, good times. But as you go deeper, you understand that there's all of this organic matter, like your uh, plants, animals, microbes living in that soil that keep these roots going. Um, that's made up of your bacteria, your fungi, your nematodes, um, which are root feeders. Um, and those kinds of things um, function in a way to, um, when you're talking about your insects um, and other things that you actually see on the surface. Um, so they feed them, they uh, create um, an environment for them to have hosts there before they emerge um, and grow into things that you see above ground. Um, and then those arthropods or like insects, bugs and things like that are there available to feed your birds and your Animals, and as I mentioned before, those mammals and those birds are, again, really, really beneficial in the garden in um, keeping everything working together. So strategies for improving your health of soil. So you can increase the organic matter. As I mentioned, leave the leaves. Um, people hate leaving leaves. Um, I know sometimes in certain areas you might get a ticket if you don't break up your leaves. If you must move your leaves, the best place to put them is around the base of trees or you can put them in the back in your compost pile. I would do your best to just take your leaves and at the end of the year and pile them up in the back or lay them across your crop uh, where you had your rows or lay them in your garden bed. 
um, before you go into the spring. Leaves are a really, really good way to put the nutrients and things back in the soil. Um, and then you can keep co uh, soils covered with cover crops um, and crop residue to reduce erosion and protect from extremes of moisture and temperature. I grow on our farm, we do like a low to no water farming method. So we typically don't use a lot of water, if any at all, on the farm. And so that requires us making sure that our water, our soil can hold water. Um, and with that comes us growing things like um, mint and other things that are cover crops because they uh, will um, keep that moisture in the soil. And if you are growing, if you have like a bigger space and you're not going to be growing in one area for that year, it's good to plant a cover crop just to keep that soil healthy. Um, one of those can be like red clover, um, sunflowers. Those are good things that you can put um, in those spaces the year before you decide to grow somewhere. And they look really beautiful and you can eat them and bring them in your house and do all kinds of things. Um, and then another thing you can do is um, plan your tillage operations carefully. Be, I don't, I do a no-till version on my garden. Um, some people don't have, uh, they have different kinds of soil, different kind of grass, and you, you gotta rip it up in order to be able to plant something on it sometimes. And so just be careful about and mindful of where you're doing that. And then ditch the lawn if you can. Um, more Michigan uh, indigenous plants. If you are in a space where you can change your lawn up a little bit so it's not just that sod um, that's not beneficial to the soil, um, then you switch it up. You know, plant things like that clover, plant um, nettles, all of those different things, little purple flowers. You can plant things to, you know, spruce it up a bit. Okay, mulches are helpful. Um, plastic mulches um, that seed early season, um, uh, they uh, enhance crop growth and the ability to withstand the insect feeding as well. You can see here, there's like straw around there, um, around, I believe those are tomato plants there. Um, reflective mulches can reduce um, aphid populations in some crops. Straw mulch can reduce problems with different beetles. It really just depends. I, I use straw mulches actually to retain moisture in my soil, not necessarily as a pest deterrent. I personally don't know how well that works um, for that specific purpose, but I do know that it definitely helps to maintain that moisture in your soil and will help to make it so you don't have to water as often. Next. Oh, okay. Um, here's like a plastic mulch um, situation that can help to pull back some of the barriers, like if you're trying to, you know, pull back weeds and things like that. Um, tillage, so it disrupts the life cycle of pests and of beneficial. So that's why you want to be be mindful of that because it can get rid of those pests, but it can also get rid of things like your monarchs. Um, can expose pests um, to predators and the natural elements. So it's kind of like you can, you know, it's like when you mow the lawn, everything is bare um, and it exposes it to the elements. Uh, uh, till before planting to control the weeds that harbor um, armyworms, cutworms, plant bugs, aphids. So that's um, one helpful thing. And then till in the fall to destroy overwintering sites like flea beetles, corn borders, um, squash. Um, but the goal is to maintain that balance as well. And then let's see, I think there's a couple more and then we can stop for some questions. Um, trap crops, that's something else I use. A trap crop is a crop that is planted to lure insect pests away from the cash crop. Successful use of traps, trap crops can be challenging. The trap crop must be more attractive to the pest than the cash crop and, and care must be given that the pests in the trap crop don't later migrate to the cash crop. Um, trap crops are not effective against pests that are weak um, flyers. Um, so, or like wind disperse. Oh, let me go back. Ooh, what am I clicking? Okay, here we go. Um, in organic systems with fewer insecticidal options, pests are often killed through crop destruction, but the timing of crop destruction is critical. Um, research on crap, crap traps has revealed mixed results. Um, and again, that's this is something that's been used for centuries. Uh, you just have to do it in a way that makes sense for you, depending on what you're growing. But all of this is true in that um, the, the, your success is going to really just depend on how much attention, attention you're paying to it. And if you are in a space where you really don't have time to monitor it, trap crops are not necessarily the way to go because it does require you paying a lot of attention to the plants to make sure that 
certain things don't fly back into certain areas and things like that. Um, I had a lot of time and energy last year to put into the put into trap crops. So it, it was different for me. So this is something I would use as almost the last resort. Um, the one I said, I do volunteer crop trap crops, as I mentioned, where sometimes if I have plants that are, I'm noticing certain of them, even if it's all the same crop are attracting a certain thing, I will move it to the outside of the garden and just grow like that. Um, and so far that has worked and I'm not sure why. Okay, here's an example of it with um, broccoli. So where the crops, where these broccoli plants are, every so many you'll see that they have a different kind of plant planted here. I'm not sure what it is um, that they have planted here, but they placed it in between um, their collard greens and um, their broccoli, so it's coming. Uh, it actually looks, oh yeah, no, those are broccoli, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what they have planted in between here in these photos, but um, they're using that as a trap crop. And I can point back, you can see that between the two of the three of these plants here in the middle, Two of them are like dark leafy greens and one of them is a brighter green to yellow color. And as I mentioned before, that's because the, the way that the, that this plant is being used as a trap crop is because it's much more attractive than those dark leafy greens. Okay, some physical controls. You can do manual controls like um, physical barriers, baits, traps, and lures. Um, that works sometimes. Um, there's other things you can do. Like you can, um, like how this, in this picture here, they've got little pots hanging up. If you don't want necessarily like neem oil on your plants or lemon balm on your plants or like lemongrass, those kinds of things sprayed on and around your plants, you can spray them on other things um, and leave those things in the garden um, outside and use them as lures in that way. Another way of manual controls, you can um, hand pick things. Uh, mow things, prune, uh, shaking uh, the plants, and then the water sprays as well. And then you have phys physical barriers. There was a question in here about the cabbage moths. You can get these kinds of, this fabric here to go over your leafy greens and things like that that are attracting those cabbages. Um, and those do a pretty good job of keeping things away from, keeping uh, things off your plants. Um, you can, uh, so it really just kind of depends. Again, this, this talks about a couple of things, floating row covers, um, mulches, trenches, pest barriers. Okay, there's a little guy planted. Uh, baits, traps, and lures. Um, there's different types of, types of traps you can get. Water traps, trap crops, sticky little thingies that they, they get on and they can't move away from. Uh, pheromone traps, you know, certain, the smell of certain plants, things like that, the smell of certain oils um, will keep uh, these things away for the most part. And then biological controls would just be those beneficial animals and insects. So what you're, what you're doing to increase this so that you are uh, increase the beneficial insects that will come in and do all of this work for you. They will enjoy it. <laughs> um, very happy to come and eat. So biological controls and action. Um, so augmentation, you increase the population through purchase and release. So essentially you're gonna go to the store, go pick up you know, those ladybugs and bring those back. Um, and, or conservation, which can be increasing existing populations through habitat conservation or other means like introducing those beneficial plants and those Michigan uh, pollinator plants. Okay. This is the, okay, so I'm going to talk about these organic pesticides. There are um, a couple more. There's some microbial pesticides that we'll talk about here. Um, I think Nigel might talk about them. I personally don't use, use them, use um, um, non-organic things, but we can talk about these organic ones really quick. But yeah, okay. Or did you want to go ahead and take a few questions before you jump into that? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay. Let's see. So we have, Frank, thank you for sharing the video that you use. Oh, yeah. We also have a question here from Marguerite. 
It says pulling up flea beetle infested plants leaves at her farm where to dispose besides the compost pile. Mm, that's a good question. You know, sometimes um, if, okay, there's two things. Well, two, there's many things you can do, but two things that come to mind first would be um, mulching or trip chipping those things up. Mm. You know, if you ha are available to like wood chip something or maybe have a wood chipper you can rent or something like that, um, you can typically chip those kinds of things up and then they, they'll be gone or you can burn them. Um, that's another option as well. Um, I found that sometimes doing some control, like a controlled little pile burn or like in a fire pit can help um, to get rid of things like that. Or you can bag them, cut them up small, bag them up and uh, put them in those brown bags to get picked up. But sometimes what I'll do is just put them in those brown bags, close them up real tight, maybe poke a hole or two in them potentially and let those bags just kind of dry and then I burn them. Okay. All right, great. Anyone else have a question before we jump into the next segment? All right, we'll go right ahead, Amanda. Um, when cultural, mechanical, and biological strategies are insufficient to pre prevent or control crop pests, weeds, or diseases, a biological or botanical substance or a substance included on the national list on the national list of synthetic substances allowed for use in organic crop production may be applied to prevent, suppress, or control weeds, pe pest, or um, disease. So one thing though, if you are certified organic or working towards that, you do need to document the use of these things in your garden. Um, it's just important to, you have to make sure that those are documented. Let's see. Okay, first one, um, pyrethrum, extracted from a flower in the chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum family. Um, a contact poison with a quick knockdown controls aphids, beetles, caterpillars, um, thripes, and mealybugs. Um, and it is, a, it is approved, pro, it's an approved um, organic uh, compound to use if you're growing organically. And then neem is extracted from the fruit of a tree grown from India. Um, to Africa works as a, hor a hormone mimic, propellant, stomach poison, and other fungicidal properties have been reported. Controls a wide variety of insects. I mean, you can use this as well. I just recommend um, diluting it. Um, meme is also something that the smell of it actually makes, it kind of makes my stomach churn a little bit. So I, per I don't really use it a whole lot because, um, I mean, it does a great job at getting rid of stuff. So um, you can use neem. I would just dilute it a little bit. Okay, and then these are the microbial pesticides. Um, I don't really truly <laughs> have too much to say on these. I don't use them. And the main reason why is because I don't want to destroy um, the ecosystem around my plants. And when it comes, um, I don't want to poison anything in my garden. The goal is to bring things in that are going to help my plants grow and keep things out that are going to feast on those plants in a parasitic way or destroy crops as a whole. Um, but ultimately I understand my role as an earth keeper is to help to maintain the balance um, in places where my human self has <laughs> colonized, right? So I try to just maintain my, my garden in a space without microbial pesticides. Um, and I know that that also, microbial pesticides help to destroy the, the habitats and the homes of those beneficial organisms. And we're in a space now where we really can't afford to have our pollinators and things like that die off. So that was a personal choice for me and that's why. Um, and I think Nigel was gonna go through these microbial pesticides here. Um, otherwise we can start answering some questions, so. No, you can go ahead and jump into the questions. I'm the same with you. I don't use those. Either, so. <laughs> um, any I thoughts? Have someone did have a, a question about the nematodes. Yeah. All that. So yeah, we can just go on to the question. Any thoughts on using nematodes for grub or other larvae control? Mm. I've never done that before, if I'm being honest. 
Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I will look into that. That's a really interesting question I hadn't thought about. Um, and it says, can you use lemon balm leaves as a fertilizer? I know you can use them as like organic matter. Um, lemon balm has such a highly potent oil in it that you do run the risk of potentially burning some of your plants, but you can definitely use it as organic matter. You know, if you've got a couple of different plants that you're all putting together. Um, yeah. Wait. Oh, somebody else answered, sorry. Um, but yeah, I would, if you were gonna, if you had lemon balm leaves and there were just like wanting to use them, um, then you can, I would throw them in as an addition to other organic uh, matter, any other green thing you might wanna toss into your compost or a fertilizer mix that you have, um, you can definitely use them. Um, another thing you can use if you're trying to find, uh, so, use something, as a fertilizer that grows naturally is nettle. Nettle is something that grows in abundance here in Detroit. Most, like when you walk outside, especially this last go, uh, the last couple of weeks, um, you walk outside and you see those little purple, they're like little purple shoots. The leaves look, uh, they're, they're green, but the leaves look very purple and they have little purple flowers on them. Um, that's our nettle. And then there's comfrey that grows in abundance around here as well. And both nettle and comfrey, you can use as fertilizer. Um, what I do is I actually take that nettle, that comfrey, and then sometimes if I have extras, like for in this instance, it would be kind of like, um, yeah, it's first, I, Sonia said, um, I use parsley leaves for my garden um, and asked about the lemon balm. Yeah, I toss those in as well. And then what I do is I take um, a jar and like a glass jar and I cover the bottom with raw sugar. And then I layer raw sugar and comfrey, raw sugar and nettle, raw sugar and whatever other thing. And in about a week of going in and pushing it down and making sure you apply pressure to it, um, it actually breaks down. And then that becomes an incredibly concentrated fertilizer that you can use out in your garden. Um, so, and you can uh, just add it to some water and that works. So that that's a really good, if you're trying to do that. And plus, Around here, especially if we're at that point in the season where everyone's getting ready to mow their lawns, um, that nettle is probably out there bounce, you know, bouncing ready. So I would go get that nettle right before you mow and uh, chop it up, use it, toss it in your compost, things like that. Got any more questions here? We have, it says off topic, what can you use? Okay, she's asking about moss in her house. Do you have any um, knowledge on that? Yeah, you can, um, I'll get some cedar, cedar wood works. I've used it, cedar wood planks. You can put it in your drawers, closets. Um, I guess it depends on where you had uh, that. Let me look up Pamela. Oh, should you use things like neem as a preventative measure or wait until you see pests? That's really up to you. You can use it as a preventative measure. It doesn't smell super good, so I kind of use it sparingly. Um, it's a little bit easier once you get, um, it's easier to wait until you see the pest because then you know where they are and then you can use it, you can use it sparingly. Um, um, and not have to just spray everything as a, as a uh, preventative. So that's the, the that's the upside to just waiting until you see something. Um, but if you are um, trying to, yeah, yeah, that's like that's like the kind of like the up the upside and downside. Um, okay, where can you get nettle? Um, I I just forage it. Um, it grows naturally in, in uh, a lot of the fields here in the city. Um, there's a really good chance you have it in your backyard. Um, it's really, really common in Michigan and really, really common in urban spaces. Um, but it usually can grow like in the backyard. And if you can't find it in the backyard, you can find it like pretty much on any vacant lot. <laughs> it's, it's got some nettle on it, um, if you know what you're looking for. Because it, it grows really robust and it really loves this climate and soil. All righty. 
So it looks like we are at the end of the slides. Did you have anything else you wanted to add before we jump into the open forum? Um, no, not no, <laughs> no, not that I could think of. I guess just more so making sure to just reiterate. You know, a lot of what I do focuses on maintaining that balance with the system versus trying to eliminate everything. You'll waste all of your time out there in the garden trying to kill everything out there. Mm -hmm. um, it's better to just get out there, enjoy it, see what comes up, see see what kinds of new pollinators you can introduce this year, um, and uh, keep everything else at bay. Okay. So we do have a little time left. I guess I'm going to put a question out there for the group, for the class. I know for myself, one of the things that Amanda um, mentioned was using basil. So I know for myself, I do use a lot of basil in my garden. I plant it everywhere. Great for the mosquitoes. It, you know, keeps a lot of pests away. So I do, I do love using basil. I tell people all the time, like plant basil. So <laughs> my question for everyone, like what is uh, your go-to pest deterrent? Like you can put it in the chat. You can, you know, yell it out. You know, just go ahead and say, what is something that you use as a deterrent in your garden? Something you can recommend to someone else that's not using that. <laughs> Um, can you say that one more time? You said uh, recommend outside of what? Any any um type of pest deterrent that anyone uses. Like I just want to know, like what are what are things people are using in their garden that they can you know recommend? I see Jamie said beer for slug. Sam Adams works well. Monica, you use onions. We have cinnamon. Soapy water, yep, I heard of the cinnamon and the soapy water. I'm not sure about onions. Monica, how do you use the onions? Do we have Monica? <laughs> okay, Monica, if you can jump in, you can tell us how you oh. use your, oh, there you go. You, you just plant them everywhere and that keeps away the uh, many different pests. Okay, I'm about to try the beer for the slugs though. Sam Adams works well. <laughs> Let's see, who else do we have? Plant them everywhere. Okay, anyone else have anything they want to share as far as any pest deterrent? Did you cover what? Uh, we did talk about the collard greens. Frank is asking about um, mm. what do you do about collard greens? And that's the aphids, right? For me, it was always a aphids were the things that came from mine. Um, mm -hmm. The soapy water works, spraying them off. Um, the neem can work, but not. I don't spray them directly on the greens. Um, in that case, um, let's see. Trap crops work in that space. That's what I used last year with my collard greens. Um, but I would try to maybe plant something this year with that some uh, uh I want to make sure I'm saying pronouncing your name correctly Sonia Son Sonia um mentioned uh making a spray oh yes so let me see uh vinegar water mixed with mint oil as a spray mm. vinegar water mixed yeah that sounds like a good one <laughs> definitely no mint and vinegar work so I'm gonna try that. Definitely gonna try that one. Well, awesome. Put the beer in an empty yogurt container, bury, bury it up to the top. The slugs will drown. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh. So they go in and trying to uh, drink it. Okay. Got it. <laughs> I'm gonna try that. Are there certain plants that you put that around or is that everywhere in your garden, uh, Jamie? All right, as we wait for that question, I guess I'm not gonna keep you all too much longer. I was, I'm sorry, it's Jamie. I was just gonna say, um, whatever they were eating, okay. whatever I noticed them around is where I put them. Okay. Okay. I'm definitely going to try that one. Well, this 
Uh, class has been recorded, so I'll be sending out the recording in the next, uh, probably uh, sometime next week. So just keep your eye out for that. Um, go ahead and check out these slides that's coming across your screen. Are zines as good as marigolds? What do you think, Amanda? I prefer marigolds myself. I've been growing them for years. I think the marigolds are have a bit, uh, uh, they're more fragrant and act as a deterrent to more things. Um, but zinnias are also really beautiful and introduced that they're beautiful and the, the brightness introduces those bees, those butterflies, those, those guys. So if you have the space and availability, I would pick, I would choose to, you know, plant them together. I'd plant them, you know, every other, something like that. It's good because they're nice and bright. Um, you can get some pretty bright marigolds too, though. So if you were like, hey, no, I can only buy one flat of something, I will go towards the marigolds because they have a stronger scent. I had a quick question. Uh, thank you for sharing about the coyote urine deterring raccoons. I'm the one with the raccoon problems in our area. My husband was asking, could even though we don't have coyotes in this area, is it still a deterrent? Like, would the raccoon still recognize oh. it? Oh, yeah, because them animals know. <laughs> yeah, that's a potential predator, right? Even though coyotes are not. Yeah, they'll be like, oh, didn't know you were here. Let's keep okay. moving. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, awesome. If there aren't any more questions, I will let you all go and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Also enjoy this holiday weekend. Get out in those gardens. Get out I'm sorry, one gardens. last question. Oh, yes, go oh, ahead, Frank. Uh, can you share your, um, Amanda, can you share, or can you put in a link, um, the, the, either a link or something or information to your garden? I wanted to get some um, herbs. There we go. Okay, perfect. Um, I just put the uh, website. It's um, just finnegansfarms.com, or you guys can find me on all platforms at literally at Finnegans Farms. Um, but yeah, anything that you find of us online is going to be Finnegans Farms, um, anything. So if you're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snap, uh, not Snapchat, uh, what's the other one? TikTok, whatever, just type in Finnegan's Farms and you'll find us. Um, and we, right now we have uh, mint and lemon balm up in terms of fresh, fresh stuff. But typically we, we do deep, more herb sales headed into June, um, just when everybody's up. But we have dill and some of, a lot of those things available right now, but yeah. You can just send us a message on our uh, our website or through Instagram. Oh. I was muted. Is dill a deterrent? Dill, yeah, yep, yep. It can act as a deterrent, like onions um, and garlic, especially if it's incredibly fragrant. Um, I have some two different kinds of dill growing right now. One of them is a lot smaller and it makes like a wider bush um, and it's not as fragrant, but I have some other ones that's um, a flowering dill um, that is very tall and it just touching it very gently puts out a lot of that dill scent. Um, so it kind of depends on the variety of dill, but for most, for the most part, when you're looking to for, for an herb, I would, um, use uh, something that's just very um, fragrant. Okay, thank you. All right, any more questions? I think I see Cynthia, were you trying to ask a question? No, Cynthia just asked the last one. Wow, oh, okay. All right. Well, I will guess this will be the end. Like Marcus, I said, you, this. you need oh. to stop. Come down. Come down here. Oh, <laughs> I don't think she's talking to us. Okay. She's not out. Come out. Come. All right, everyone. Have a good evening. Enjoy your weekend. Get out in those gardens. And we Thank will you. see you at the next class. All righty. All right. Have a good night.
You too. Thank you. You're welcome.